I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to the conversation with Al McFarland. Today is Wednesday, October 5th, 2022. Uh, Wednesdays, we check in in what I call uh, building wealth in the community. Uh, you may be hearing the regular seasonal sirens going off since be the first Wednesday of the month. So please bear with that distraction. That's the, uh, the city. Uh, we talk about wealth creation, building wealth, both for individuals and for families. And today we're going to go down that path. Let me start, though, by introducing my writing partner, who um, I shared with my guest uh, a few minutes before we went on air. Brenda Lau Gray joins me every day from the mountains of New Mexico. Brenda and I are kindergarten classmates. She's an author, a former educator, uh, and uh, a good friend. Brenda, how are you doing? Good to see you, my friend. I'm fine. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. We've got a great program today uh, dealing with various aspects, approaches to wealth creation. And I want to jump right in. I want to jump in because I often lead with talking about housing, owning a home as one of the principal methods for creating wealth for Americans or probably anybody in the world, the land, the asset. We're fortunate to have Jennifer Ho. She's the Minnesota Housing Commissioner. Uh, Jennifer, good to see you again. Commissioner, thank you for being here. Uh, how are you doing? Good to see you again. It's uh, terrific to be here. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Well, let's jump right in. Uh, and I'd like to start by giving our viewers and listeners uh, an idea of uh, Housing uh, Commission 101, Minnesota Housing 101. Talk about your organization, your portfolio, your mission, and uh, the objectives you have as a leader. I, uh, I run a state agency, so I'm appointed by the governor, and I basically run the state's housing bank. I, um, as the state's housing bank, we do everything from helping people who are first-time homebuyers. Uh, you can get down payment assistance uh, through our lending partners. Um, if you old and own an older home, you can get a rehab loan, uh, maybe to help you age in place in that home, or just deal with basic health and safety uh, things that need to be fixed up around the house. Uh, we do uh, new construction and preservation of both single family and uh, uh, multifamily rental housing. And we do it in every single corner of the state. I, um, uh, there's not a single corner of the state that doesn't have a problem with having enough housing, especially housing that's affordable to folks who make the least. And so as government, it's our job to step into that space. What's the great history, the great story about housing and the creation of America's middle class? Uh, particularly post-World War II. Uh, how did America become as healthy and as, um, I think, uh, uh, robust as it is as a global middle-class society? What do you think? Well, I mean, Al, I don't need to say this to you, but robust for some and not so much for others, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so after World War II, the GI Bill uh, uh, really created some advantages for white GIs. Um, and created opportunities for home ownership. My dad's actually from Hawaii. I, uh, I found out recently when I got this job, actually, that my parents uh, bought their house in Fridley on the GI Bill, which means that they got help with down payment and they got a below market uh, interest rate value on that home. I, uh, my dad was making two bucks an hour uh, at Univac back in the day. So I, you know, I think there has always been, kind of starting in that period, uh, government kind of putting its hand into the market to, 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 to intervene. And the intervention made home ownership easier for some and harder for others. And, uh, and that was federal policy, uh, reinforced locally, uh, redlining, who could get loans and live in which communities, uh, who got uh, assistance from the government, uh, you know, and then where did the value of those homes rise the greatest. And so I think one of the things that we're taking really seriously at Minnesota Housing is that government shaped through intentional policies the inequity in home ownership, uh, for example, that we have today. And so what is government's responsibility in trying to shape our way out of it? And so that has been uh, that has been definitely a centerpiece of the conversation that we've had at Minnesota Housing during my tenure. What's the difference uh, being made by uh, Jennifer Holt being commissioner? What do you bring, uh, Commissioner, to the work in terms of uh, understanding, sensibility, and passion, uh, and intentionality? What do you, 
what are you making happen because uh, you see it as both mission and uh, duty? Well, I appreciate the question. It's been a very humbling three and a half years being the commissioner during a pandemic. I'll tell you that. I, um, but I think what I brought uh, into the role that was slightly different from my predecessors is I've been working on ending homelessness since 1999. And uh, I've done that running a nonprofit. I've done that out, uh, in Washington, D.C. I worked for seven years for uh, the Obama administration. Um, and so I think really understanding that the most egregious problems in our housing system are people who don't have one, people who are living outside. And that also is disproportionately indigenous people, African-Americans. So that housing disparities in Minnesota impact everything from who's experiencing homelessness, who's being uh, paying you know, half their income on rent, and you know, who has an opportunity at home ownership. And, and so I think you know, what I've asked my team is a couple things, it is that yes, we need to celebrate what we do well, but we always need to be thinking about people who are most impacted by what's happening in the housing world and who don't have access to what we do, right? And, um, and we really need to um, listen not only to the people that, 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 that build and preserve housing, we need to listen to the people who need it. Hmm. And we need to understand what they need and, and what they want and be open to different types of ways of doing things and different ways of thinking about things than maybe the agency historically did. Is it difficult to sh turn the uh, tide in huge bureaucracies uh, in state governments? I raise the question uh, because uh, the state is probably the biggest employer in the state. I'm guessing that I may be wrong. Certainly, the state has uh, uh, you know more assets and resources than any other single individual institution. So it's a big organization and a lot of interest, and it's complicated. Uh, how difficult is it to change things in the direction that you see as beneficial as fulfilling the mandate of uh, creating equality, uh, access, and um, the potential? of a, you know, a growing uh, and fair society. How difficult is that? You know, one of the things I learned when I was out at HUD, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, they, they seem to be like the state agency that everybody knows by their acronym. But when I was out there is that it took a long time to make something happen. Mm -hmm. But when something happened, it had nationwide impact. And I feel that way, um, I mean, in a way, compared to being at HUD, being at Minnesota Housing, I, you know, we're a little guy. We've got 285 staff, um, you know, we're, we're a small agency compared to other the big state agencies. But I think, you know, we all know that like, you know, the arc of justice, you know, is long and, and you have to have, you have to know what you're trying to do and you have to persist and, you know, I think the last, you know, three and three quarters years that I've had the privilege of serving in this position, it's been very um, tough political times, you know, and we do our work in partnership with the legislature. And so getting consensus there, uh, I think, just takes, uh, you know, persistence. And I think that um, getting through this pandemic. Mm -hmm. has just put an overlay um, mm -hmm. on things. But at the same time, I've been here long enough to begin to feel the impact of some of the decisions I've helped to influence and what we're doing. So in terms of investing in developers of color uh, to make sure that our, our competition process for our housing finance money, uh, that we are uh, helping create wealth in communities by investing in developers of color. I think we're starting to see uh, a shift in, in the way our prioritizing and our competitions work uh, to do that. I think we're doing more units uh, than before I came for people who are making 50% or 30% of the area median income or below, mm -hmm. as opposed to doing uh, kind of the, the higher end of what's called affordable housing. And, and so you can see um, these shifts, you know, come to play over time. And the thing about housing finance is, you know, you make a decision one year that impacts how funding decisions get made the next year that impacts how something gets built the year after that. Mm -hmm. You know, so you got to have a long view in housing. Mm -hmm. you, you've mm -hmm. got to have a long view. I, um, 
I also am lucky. I mean, I think the governor and lieutenant governor, I think when all is said and done, they're going to prove to have had the strongest track record on housing of any administration. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, and, and there were significant things done by my predecessors. So, you know, so the bar was pretty high. I, uh, but, but for me, this is a pervasive problem all across the state. We don't have enough units, period. And we don't have enough units that are affordable to folks who make the, the least. And we have a system that was built on intentional discrimination, and we need to find ways to reverse the, uh, the impacts that that has had on wealth creation in communities of color. When you talk about systemic uh, deprivation, uh, marginalization, do you get pushed back from that? I raise the question because uh, I'm out here in the streets in the community, and if you know me, you know I'm cr- always criticizing uh, supremacist uh, thought or practices or policies. And sometimes you get the feeling, maybe you do, I do, that uh, people get tired of hearing it. Uh, and I'll be more succinct that white people get tired of hearing it and they feel like uh, we are making uh, things uncomfortable for them to always bring up uh, the statistics, the data that show that problems are not new, that they have uh, persisted and that uh, they are a reflection of a certain you know, common uh, understanding and will that, as you said, left certain people out of it. So what kind of um, energy are you encountering as a, a person of color in a leadership position and in a position of authority? How does that look? How does it work for you? You know, I, I don't feel like I get a lot of pushback I am, uh, I am very racially and ethnically mixed. I am, uh, I'm an out lesbian, I'm a little gender non-conforming in my attire. And it's been kind of surprising to me that, uh, that and maybe it's just because I'm in my 50s. You know, I just, I just don't feel like I get a lot of pushback uh, for me being me. I think what's been interesting to me in the conversation about housing is that there doesn't seem to be a lot of pushback around history. I think that there is, whether it's the Realtors Association or the builders, the cities uh, or the legislature, I think that there is a deeper understanding of, uh, of redlining and racial covenants and how we got here. And you can't overlook the data, um, the disparities data, so I don't get pushback on history and I don't get pushback on the facts. I think where the conversation gets interesting is what are we going to do about it? Right. And, um, you know, I had the opportunity to carry the governor's uh, housing budget proposal last session. It was over a billion dollars for housing and homelessness, which is extraordinary, really, when you think about the traditional level of state investments in these things. Um, And it was exciting to be able to talk about what we could do on everything from homelessness to rental housing to preservation of naturally occurring affordable housing to single family, first time home buyers and all that. It was exciting. And then it was just incredibly disappointing to come out with no deal, Uh, especially now. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mm -hmm. uh, a historic state surplus. The folks who are doing well are doing fine. Right. And so it just seems like it's the time to invest. And I think that's where the fundamental disagreement happened in an election year at the Capitol with a divided government, Republicans controlling the Senate, Democrats controlling the House. You know, what's interesting is when I travel around the state, it doesn't matter if I'm in a red district or a blue district, everybody tells me we need more housing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the way to get more housing is year after year investment by the state. Mm-hmm. And no time is better than now when we have this, this surplus and the opportunity to make these investments. And I mean, uh, I mean, you know this as well as anybody, but if we don't get housing right, it's hard to get education right. It's hard to get health care right. It's hard to get jobs right. It's hard to get public safety right. Mm-hmm. But when we get housing right, that creates the foundation for everything else to come together. And so I, uh, I'm confident that if I have the opportunity to serve in a second term with this governor, we will come into the legislative session with a very significant uh, proposal for investing in housing. And I hope uh, that we can um, convince 
you know, uh, a majority of legislators that, that's and, the right thing maybe, to do. Maybe, Now's maybe, the time. Maybe you'll have the control of the Senate this time with a little luck. You know, I, I, uh, I don't forecast elections. I, I, I got very humbled in 16, so I'm, I'm done with that. Understand. I uh, share with people on this book, and it's a book produced here in Minnesota. It's called Whiteness in Plain View by Dr. Chad Montry, who's a, a University of Massachusetts Lowell a history department professor. And this is kind of uh, brings us to the things you've already introduced that you can respond to. And I'll certainly ask uh, the other commissioners that follow you to respond to it. All of it has to do with our intent of focusing on um, eliminating barriers to uh, people that have been traditionally excluded. But on the liner notes, I'll read a paragraph. Uh, the notes say whiteness in plain view examines the ways white residents across Minnesota acted to intimidate, uh, control, remove, and keep out African-Americans over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries. Their methods ranged from anonymous threats, vandalism, and mob violence, to restrictive housing covenants, realtor deceit, and mortgage discrimination, and they were aided by local, state, and federal government agencies, as well as openly complicit public officials. What they did was not an anomaly or an aberration in some particular place or a passing moment, but rather common and continuous. Chapter by chapter, this book shows that Minnesota's overwhelming whiteness is neither accidental nor incidental, and that racial exclusion's legacy is very much woven into our state's contemporary politics, economy, and culture. Everything he says in this book, you just said, Commissioner, uh, and thank you for being forthright uh, and direct in uh, putting uh, the topics, the issues on the table. Uh, I think back to uh, when we first organized, and Jeffrey, who will be on earlier, remembers we were doing things about real estate and home ownership back in the, oh, I'm, I'm not sure the year, uh, 10, 12 years ago, promoting uh, when, 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 when opportunity in housing seemed to be really real, before the big uh, bubble and the, um, uh, what, what was the right word for it? Uh, the extraction of wealth, the loss of black wealth uh, because of real estate, because of the lending policies and redlining policies and the deception of the industry. And the industry moved to, from my point of view, blame the housing crisis on black people in the real estate business, not on policies of banks and of lenders and not on uh, the inability of agencies to police and manage and monitor, you know, uh, corruption that was kind of uh, part of the way we did business. And so how do we get Black people that were pushed out of real estate back in with the new gusto and an ability to be in the front of leading the change and leading the effort to rebuild wealth in the Black community? We lost a lot of money Black people in Minnesota in particular lost a lot of money. We were already way down, but we almost got wiped out. And uh, there have been reports detailing uh, the lack of wealth and the loss of wealth in the Black community. What do you think, Commissioner? I mean, yes. <laughs> I, mean, I think, uh, I mean, when I first got my job, the African American Leadership Forum hosted an event over at the Guthrie uh, I think the event was called Trust Black Women and Girls and had an opportunity to just sit and listen to stories of, of in this instance, women. Um, I remember one woman just saying, you know, when your family owned a home and it was taken away from them through eminent domain to build a freeway, mm -hmm. it's really hard to believe that home ownership is the right next step for you, right? because we have disadvantaged black homeowners in so many ways, whether through the terms of their mortgage, uh, the value of the neighborhoods, uh, or taking homes away to build interstates or you know, so-called urban rule. I, uh, and I think there is discrimination alive and well 
in the appraisal market today and in the lending markets today. And so, you know, I think the, the enforcement work of enforcing agencies is important. I, um, fundamentally, we have a private market housing system and uh, it is governed by money as opposed to being a kind of a value-based system um, that appreciates that, that everybody uh, uh, will, will succeed if they have stable housing. And, and so that's the thing that I think we're fundamentally up against is that we don't have a public benefit housing system in this country. We've got a, public, a private market system that has some public patchwork mm -hmm. from HUD, from tax policy, you know, from the state. And so I think, you know, but I'm really impressed. I know you have um, a guest coming on from, from Build Wealth. I mean, the work that we do in partnership with Build Wealth and that they do. I, um, the work we do with the Homeowner uh, uh, Alliance, where you've got uh, people who are uh, black lenders or black counselors who are also homeowners who can help walk people through mm -hmm. the steps, you know, help people who don't have credit build credit, uh, you know, credit in and of itself, you know, racism has played through credit and yet we use credit foundationally to qualify for a mortgage. I, um, you know, it's so intertwined, but I think, you know, what we do know is that there's about 60,000 uh, households of color, if you will, in Minnesota who are renters mm -hmm. who make enough money to buy a home. I, uh, now, homeownership is not going to be right for all of them. You know, mm -hmm. everybody's got their own, their own reasons, but people should at least understand how that math can work for them. And uh, because when you rent at the end of the day, um, all that money just goes to your, to your landlord. But when you pay your mortgage, some of that accrues back to you. And I, and I think that that, you know, that's the piece. But I'm also in lots of conversations where people are like, you know, don't hold up homeownership as the only way to, to build wealth. You can build wealth by having a rental unit you can afford, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that helps too. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about duplexes and threeplexes, triplexes, you know, the opportunity to, to be an owner and to be a landlord um, and to be able to, you know, uh, to do that. I think, you know, cooperative ownership is another thing uh, that we're looking at, uh, you know, work with the community land trust. I mean, there's a lot of, of things that need to be done. They just need to be done at scale and they need to be done with intention of reaching black communities and helping close these, um, these despicable gaps. I, I, um, I just saw new data out yesterday from the, uh, uh, the American Community Survey that helps us track home ownership. And, and Minnesota continues to have one of the highest home ownership rates in the country. And the good news is, is that the amount of, of um, home ownership amongst all communities of color also went up, but it only went up very incrementally mm -hmm. uh, for black Minnesotans. And so that gap between black and white households continues to be uh, very severe. Um, it's just going to take a lot of partnership and a lot of intentionality and a lot of trust building and a lot of investment year after year after year to fix this. Commissioner Jennifer Holt, thank you so much. Uh, she's the commissioner of uh, Minnesota Housing. Stick around as long as you want to. Uh, I'll be talking to colleagues of yours, your contemporaries on the uh, cabinet uh, governing our state of Minnesota. Let me <clears throat> thank you so much, first of all. Let me bring in Alice. Well, Robert. it's great to be here. I just, I just want to say thank you and thanks for highlighting this issue and, and thank you for your questions. And I'm going to have to go out and buy that book. So thank well, you. Well, please do. And then, you know, know that you're welcome here anytime. We think that we can play a supportive role uh, getting your vision abroad uh, in our community. Our mission has to be to create a new narrative, a new understanding and to give our people the vocabulary, the language that allows us to articulate a future in which we win. And thank you for being the person at the uh, wheel 
uh, directing this movement in building community. Thank you. I'm so happy much. to stay around if you want to have me. I'll just, uh, I, I would okay. love to hang out with yeah. the guests. Okay, great. Hang around. Uh, Alice Roberts Davis, good afternoon. How are you? With you, Al, and with my friend and colleague, Commissioner Ho. Well, it's, I'm so lucky to have uh, two commissioners and an assistant commissioner on the program today. Uh, we'll be talking to Tiki Brown momentarily and then bringing someone that was referred to earlier, uh, Jeffrey Robinson, who's with the uh, Build Wealth Minnesota. But, you know, let me take a minute to uh, talk about you uh, uh, and to welcome you. You're the commissioner of Minnesota's Department of Administration, and you've got a dozen administrative services divisions that report to you. Uh, they include purchasing real estate property, uh, fleet, risk management, demographic analysis, and continuous improvement services. You're part of the uh, cabinet of uh, the governor and lieutenant governor, Governor Walsh and Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flan Flanagan. And uh, your focus is on making sure that uh, uh, the sole notion of equity and inclusivity means something in this administration and in the state of Minnesota. Uh, before you were commissioner, uh, you uh, were in the department as assistant commissioner overseeing a uh, real estate and construction uh, right. project or division responsible for $2.5 billion in annual spending. Uh, and it goes on. I'll let you talk more about what you have done and what that learning curve has meant for you uh, now that you are a leader. You've worked in corporate as well. Uh, you can yes. talk about that as well. Uh, you're yes. a lawyer. You're a lawyer and and a journalist. So uh, bringing a lot to this work. I wanted to uh, start by uh, asking you to talk about uh, some things going on that you're doing here in North Minneapolis in the next couple of next few days, I think, uh, October 12th. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thanks. It's great to be back here with you again, Al. Uh, we have a lot going on at the Department of Administration, and I, I tell people we have uh, really about 25 divisions because we keep growing. And I know as commissioner, I'm not allowed to play favorites, but some of my favorite divisions are our Office of Equity and Procurement and our procurement technical assistance centers. Um, those groups do phenomenal work with our community. Uh, they do a lot working with our small business community and also with Minnesota businesses, ensuring that they have opportunities to do contracts with state, federal, and local government. Uh, a lot of the work that the Department of Administration does is with state government agencies. And so uh, a lot of that work doesn't get seen by Minnesotans, but what I love about our Office of Equity and Procurement and PTAC is that that's work that we are doing directly with Minnesotans, and we're out in the community every day. We do more than 100 outreach events. We do about 8,000 hours of one-to-one -one counseling with uh, Minnesota business owners to help them understand how they can interact with state government and earn contracts. And, uh, Sotans. and so something that's coming up on October 12th that we're super excited about is the, um, the I don't want to get the name of it wrong, it is called Cracking the Code, and it is State mm -hmm. Purchasing Power and Economic Prosperity in North Minneapolis. And that'll be an event that's happening from 8.30 to noon at the UROC Center in, in North Minneapolis. And we'll spend time talking to both business owners who are doing business with the state, and then we'll have panelists from our agencies who will talk to anyone who's in the audience about how we're looking at business owners, how we think you need to come prepared and give you tips on how to do business with the state as well. This is something that we've done year over year, but this will be the first time that we've been able to do it in person in a number of years. And so we're really excited about welcoming community back in person and getting an opportunity to meet business owners again. Uh, so that's what's happening on October 12th. Cracking the code, it's a great name. What does it imply? What does it mean? What's the thought behind that? Uh, I'll let you go. People think that it's really complicated to do business with the state. And what we've been working on for the last 
five to seven years is simplifying how to do business with the state, federal, and local governments. We've done a lot of work around streamlining those processes and making government contracts much more accessible. Uh, and I think we've done a tremendous job. There are a lot of people who say, oh, I've tried to do business with the state. It's not worth my time as a small business owner. Uh, if you haven't tried in the last two or three years, now is the time to try again, because we really, again, have expanded our team from less than one FTE. We now have 11 people on the PTEC side and uh, six people on the OEP side who are there working with business owners to uh, ensure that you have the opportunities available to you to grow your businesses. And you don't have to take it from me. If you come to the event, you'll hear it directly from Minnesota business owners who are uh, making great strides and really growing their businesses. I made reference to a report uh, that, uh, I can't remember the author of the report, but it was a public report about state spending with uh, minority businesses and black businesses in particular. and. If I remember correctly, uh -huh. at that time, uh, the state was kind of um, uh, taking some credit for moving purchases with black businesses from uh, in the hundreds of thousands up to one or two million dollars. Uh, it, it was really uh, an embarrassment for the state, I believe, and for you know, our business community. Where do we stand now? How? much real progress has been made are you reporting out in terms of the state's intent and capacity and results in moving more money into uh, black communities through purchasing and businesses we still have a lot of work to do al um that is no there's no question about that uh, the report that you're talking about had us at $119,000 with Black-owned businesses. Mm -hmm. Today, we're at about $6 million. So definitely not where we want to be, but you can see that the momentum is there and that the effort is there and that I feel like we have found the right levers to pull in order to make that, um, that real progress that we need to see. We just need more black owned businesses, which is why we continue to do the outreach. We only have about 300 certified businesses. And what I want to also uh, make sure that we're uh, clear about is that when we're talking about the spend, we're only talking about small certified businesses. So there is more spend that's happening with black owned businesses, sure. but we're only talking about those that are small and that have gone through our state certification process. So we want to ensure that we get as many businesses as we can into the state certification process so that we can make them eligible for those specific programs that are intended for this the growth and that spend that we're talking about. I also want to say that we have grown the spend to over $150 million across the entire program, which is more than double than where we were uh, this time just six years ago. And so a lot of progress there. And with a ship as large as the state of Minnesota, that kind of progress just doesn't happen without a whole lot of concerted effort and a lot of uh, unity across the state enterprise to make that work happen. All things being equal, Commissioner, if um, if we were able to say that you know, we've met all of our goals and have everything working the way we envisioned it could and should work, reflecting equity, uh, access, uh, unfettered participation, and, uh, you know, full utilization of systems of support, what would that look like? Um, how much would the state be spending with minority business in general, with black businesses in particular? And I raised the question because uh, back in the day when we'd have community meetings about this, particularly around construction, uh, there was an argument that sought to illustrate uh, the loss of wealth, loss of income, loss of opportunity that said, if the state had a goal of say 25 or 35% uh, participation by minority businesses in highway construction, for example, and that the spend that year is gonna be a billion dollars, but the state only achieved 5% or 7%, it meant that 20% of our money was being left and spent by somebody else. So that logic helped people visualize Number one, the fact that we could be doing more, we should be doing more, and raise the question, why aren't we doing more? Is it us? Is it them? Is it all of us together? 
Uh, how do you address that? And how do you, uh, again, the first part of the question, what would it be like if everything was working? And if we had the, uh, you know, this machine fine tuned and well oiled and steaming into the future, uh, the model of equity and uh, inclusion, how would that look? Um, periodically, the state undergoes a disparity study, and it's not something that we do because we don't know or we're not sure if there are disparities in the state. We are sure that there are disparities in spending in the state, but we do it so that we have the legal and statutory basis that we need to continue the programs that we have in the state. Uh, the last time that we undertook a disparity study was 2017, and we did ask the legislature for money last year so that we could do a fresh disparity study. Um, we didn't get that, but the last we undertook led us to set the state's first goal ever for spending, and that goal was 12%. Uh, right now, the state is at about 8% overall for spending, which uh, is the reason why that I, I say that we are not where we need to be with spending. Mm -hmm. We continue to work toward that 12% goal. At the same time, we are... Um, at $150 million overall in spend, which again is double where we were when we first started. And those are real dollars that are going into our community uh, business owners' pockets. So we're happy about that, but we continue to really push the envelope and come up with new policies and ways that we can create programs, policies, and procedures that will make our spending more robust and really be creative about how we get more businesses, which is really where we find the most tension between where our program needs to grow, more businesses that we can um, put into the program so that we continue to see growth. So the spend could easily eclipse uh, 300 million a year. It's at 150 okay. mil, right? Uh, would that hit your 8% or your 10% target? What I'm will sorry, be the number? No. What will be the number if you were able to hit your, your 8% target? We Oh, your we would need about another $65 million um, okay. to get to the 12% growth. Okay. Okay. 12%. Great. Listen, any any other comments that you want to make? I'm glad that you're here and glad that you're sharing. Uh, I want you to keep inviting people to be at your event on Wednesday, October 12th. But what are the concerns yes. that do you want us to be aware of and to either raise questions or, or explore for our own edification? What I want to say is that we have so many opportunities for businesses to do business with the state. We're so proud of the work that we've done, and we really want to continue to grow this program. Um, anyone who's interested in doing business with the state should reach out to their Office of Equity and Procurement or our Procurement Technical Assistance Center. Uh, our business owners who have had that opportunity really do see uh, the bid matching systems that we use and all of the free services that we offer as beneficial to them. Uh, so. We're proud of our programs. They get recognition perennially, nationally, uh, for the work that they do. The state of Minnesota has really uh, done a lot of things that are being recognized at a national level because we are, uh, although uh, in our infancy with this program and a lot of work to do, doing a lot of things very well. Al, can I just jump in here and just say, you know, mm -hmm. the work that Commissioner Roberts Davis and her team is doing is super cool and it's, it's the right type of stuff. So I'll just also make a plug for considering state employment. Because mm -hmm. you can work on this from the inside and work with really cool people like Alice uh, while you're doing it. So uh, just a plug for state service. It's uh, it can sound bureaucratic sometimes, but we're really, you know, working on turning the ship. We're on the same page, uh, Commissioner. I was going to ask you to jump in and you did. So thank you so much. But I want to bring in Tiki on the same spirit that Tiki Brown uh, is with the uh, Department of Human Services and, uh, or, excuse me, Children and Family Services Assistant Commissioner. Uh, Tiki, good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Uh, give us a one on one on your organization, its mission, its work. Sure. Thanks for having me. And uh, really great to be here with um, Jennifer and Alice, who just props to both of you. It's just doing great work. Um, so yeah, so I uh, am the assistant commissioner for children and family services that covers childcare programs, 
uh, child support, economic assistance programs, including the Minnesota Family Investment Program or MFIB, um, the SNAP program, or sometimes people call it EBT, um, child safety and permanency as well. So um, a lot of uh, programs that support low-income individuals and really form that, that safety net. How do the three of you work together? This is off script, uh, but I can't pass up the opportunity to make this a, a, a conversation of three uh, powerful, powerful women leaders in our state. Uh, how do you see yourselves collaborating, working together with your other colleagues, commissioners, assistant commissioners, to move uh, the quality of life, to expand opportunity for all of us, and particularly our people, black and brown uh, and indigenous people. Uh, Tiki, you first, and then uh, 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 Alice and Jennifer, jump in where you want to. I, let's have the conversation. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. I mean, so a lot of the programs that I uh, represent here at with DHS include uh, programs in which we are granting you know, we have contracts with community partners. And one of my missions has always been to encourage and increase the number of um, organizations of color and, you know, with our nonprofit grant making. So everything that Commissioner Robert was saying was just exactly what, we're, what we've been focused on. And she has made it so much easier for us to do that. And so our equity and grant making efforts are incredibly strengthened by the work that she's doing in her office. And then with Commissioner Ho, um, one of my programs includes some uh, uh, five different programs in the area of homelessness. And so again, with her vision and her focus in on um, justice and equity um, in this space, our, our, our um, departments work really closely together, really closely with um, staff, and then really having that holistic approach that we are serving all areas of, um, of the population's needs in, in that space. So I'll stop there. Um, uh, yeah, hom homelessness is one space. I mean, the governor and lieutenant governor also have a children's cabinet uh, that brings in uh, all of the agencies uh, with the goal of making Minnesota the best place to raise a kid. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, really understanding the ways in which uh, our different departments contribute to that uh, and how we focus on that, I think is really important. I think we learned a lot about emergency aid. Uh, through the course of this pandemic. And, uh, and that's been an area where uh, Minnesota Housing has looked to our friends at the Department of Human Services uh, that do much more direct assistance to just uh, to help us learn and guide us in that work. And, and I'll, I'll ditto that the Department of Admin has helped us um, with lots of different uh, ways of thinking about procurement. I mean, most recently, one of the things that we've been doing is contracting with people with lived experience of homelessness, hmm. any homelessness in their past, to help <clears throat> work with our teams that work on that issue to create a definition of housing justice, racial justice, and health justice that will center and guide our work on ending homelessness and is really a part of our budget discussions. How do we put together a budget that really has health justice, housing justice, and uh, racial justice uh, you know, at their core? And so I, I think the level, I, I'm on a lot of interagency groups. Uh, there's an enterprise-wide group, uh, the, the Office of Equity and Inclusion. Uh, we do work together around people with disabilities. Uh, we do work together on climate. We do work together on sustainability. There is so much cross-agency work that's going on. And I always say that the, the one issue areas are solvable issues. Now you want the real hard problems. It's the, they're the intersectional issues, uh, but that's mm. also where you know where where it gets fun because I get to work with people like Tiki and her team. Tiki, my notes for you uh, talk about uh, you know a recent study where SNAP benefits, for example, uh, linked to better health, and you have uh, work that you do with family, friends, and neighbors and child care grants. Talk about those in particular, uh, and. Uh, you know, priorities for you going forward. Right. So I'll speak first to um, the the recent study that that our teams put together, and and I think I'll link it a little bit to some of the other earlier conversations you had, just about the importance of of equity and 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 um, you know, are are people getting tired of the conversation? Are they mm -hmm. responding well? And I think part of the work that we're doing here within the department is embedding an anti-racism effort throughout 
every single aspect of our work. And so that includes just continuous education and information that really doesn't allow for, <laughs> doesn't allow for um, maybe a little bit of, uh, you know, feeling like we've heard this before, right? Because I think it just encourages more nuances to the conversation. And so one of those nuances includes what are, what are our evaluation efforts in terms of really digging into the different policies that we have in place and what are, you know, we know, we know, we all know the disparities that exist. They've existed for a long time, mm -hmm. but digging deeper into what are the policy levers that if we can modify have an impact on those disparities. So uh, we team together with our, um, our, our medical assistance folks and really began to look at a federal policy that allows folks who, um, who do not have children to only be on SNAP or EBT for three months out of a 36 month time frame. And it's a policy that, um, you know, we are bound to to adhere to because it's a federal policy. We can't modify it or change it. Mm -hmm. And as we dug into that, we really wanted to find out what are some, beyond anecdotes, what are some real um, explanations we can have about the cost that it has on our systems. And what it found is that um, every month that a uh, individual is off of SNAP because they've been cut off from that benefit, that very basic need of food, their medical costs increased by $100. Wow. So we're not paying, you know, we're not doing the preventative work from the from the beginning, but at, we're actually paying for it at the at the end as well. You're and so that's more yeah. exactly exactly. Yeah. And so we are working, you know, with our congressional delegation. This is a, a time of year um, in which there is opportunity to um, make a pitch to change uh, federal law with the Farm Bill. And so that is one law that we're really advocating uh, should be changed. That doesn't matter if you are with children or without children, you should just be able to have food benefits for as long as you need them. So that's that's that piece. The other piece I'll just mention briefly too is our uh, family, friends, and neighbors. So this is in the childcare space. And this is really, you know, you probably have heard this as you're out and about in the community that um, uh, the workforce situation is is pretty difficult, right? And so as 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 we're looking at the childcare situation, it's also difficult. We know that there uh, we're both losing childcare providers. It's difficult for folks to find affordable childcare. And mm -hmm. so one of the ways we're trying to address that is to look at uh, different populations that can provide childcare, such as family, friends, and neighbors, right? A trusted trusted neighbor, trusted mm -hmm. friend, um, a trusted family member that can receive uh, reimbursement for that care. And so we're expanding that population, trying to get more information about that population who's interested. And then, um, so we're doing some evaluation in that and and then gradually increasing the investment in, in that just to provide a array of childcare options for folks. So um, no matter where they're at, if they're working, you know, a night shift, if they're working the day shift, they have just some options. Give me the uh, the elevator uh, version of your own career, uh, Commissioner. What's your background, your story? Yeah. So, well, I've worked at the department for 20 years. So I uh, am a strong believer in state government and would echo, echo Commissioner Hose, come work for us, come work with us. Um, I, you know, it's it's been an interesting career trajectory. I began really focused in on 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 food, food assistance and food supports. Um, my own childhood experience is that my family utilized many of the same exact programs that I spoke about earlier, um, and continues to use many of the same programs that I'm working in. And so it's very personal you, for me. Are you from Minnesota? Are you a native Minnesotan? I moved here when I was in fourth grade. I was an army brat, so mm -hmm. we experienced moving um, many, many places, and then eventually settled here um, in a rural in a rural city. Um, mm -hmm. And so, what's your, your family from? Uh, my dad was from North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, I was born in an army base in Kentucky, mm -hmm. and my mother actually immigrated here from Finland. So I have a little bit of that immigrant experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, great, great. Uh, let me bring Jeffrey in and we'll wrap it up. Uh, Jeff Robinson is a program manager at Build Wealth and uh, their branded product is uh, something he's co-founder of. That's the 9,000 Equities Initiative. And uh, Jeff, thank you for being here. Thank you for the vision, the work of you and the team over at Build Wealth Minnesota. Uh, talk about this great work, uh, this idea 
of 9,000 equities, that as a collaborative, and also uh, talk about the upcoming Black Men's Legacy Summit. I think it's going to be uh, presenting on Saturday, October 29th. Uh, Jeff, good afternoon. And in the course, speak to all the other things we've talked about over this hour that uh, you've been a player and participant, actor, commenter on over the, your career in this community. And so um, I'm a transplant um, here in Minneapolis, Minnesota from Chicago. Uh, moved up here and actually I came to go to school here at the University of Minnesota Morris. Uh, <clears throat> Like most most of my friends here in Minnesota, they they seek out black universities to get the black experience. Well, I sought out white universities to get the white experience <laughs> uh, because I grew up in an all black neighborhood, all black family. Uh, the only family, only the only members of my community that were white were either teachers or police officers. And at the end of their shift, they went home. And so, um, but that's just a little bit about me, Southern boy. Um, I live in North Minneapolis, been in the community for years, uh, working to find a way to make impact in a way that matters uh, uh, from the grassroots level and on up. And David and myself, uh, during the time of George Floyd, we were participating in a, uh, a training um, by, uh, that was offered to us by Prosperity Now to help build uh, high impact nonprofits of color, to strengthen them with the uh, uh, the infras to provide them with the training and the infrastructure to to grow their organization, to come to scale, to to have a bigger impact. And there were three initiatives that David and I had worked on that that we wanted as a capstone product project for. Once we came through this training, what were some of the things that we wanted to accomplish? And while we were going through it, we were like, the dial for home ownership is going the wrong way mm. for African Americans. It's instead of going up, it's now going down. And it was at one point, I believe, when I first moved to Minnesota, I think it was about twenty nine percent for the home ownership rate. And at that time, when we came up with the initiative nine thousand equities, it was at twenty five, twenty six percent. And when you when you put um, a comparative of white ownership versus white renters against um, in a pie chart against um, black owners versus black renters. They look identical except for <laughs> except for 75 percent of, of white households are, own, are homeowners, whereas 75 percent of black households are renters and 25 percent of white homeowners are. Uh, households are, are renters and 25% uh, of black households are owners. And um, and we were like, okay, so what do we do? I mean, how can we, how can we turn the tide? And the 9,000 equities was birthed out of that question because it's enough is enough. You know, uh, we're tired of not having, or we're tired of the conversations about what is happening versus what is done. And one of the things you had made mention earlier, Al, was um, you brought up a, a book, um, I think White and Plain Sight. I'm not sure the name of it. White, whiteness and Plain View. Okay, Whiteness and Plain View. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you described that there was, uh, it took a concerted effort comprised of government, private, public institutions with the support of the public to rob us of our wealth, then it shouldn't be to anyone's surprise that it's gonna take a concerted effort of government, private, public institutions with the public support to restore us of our wealth. And so the 9,000 Equities Initiative is, is, a, is, a, is a campaign to help 9,000 black families get into home ownership over the next five to seven years. And, um, and this campaign is, 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 is not something that Bill Wolf can take on on their own. We're not, we're not a big enough institution yet to do that. And so, but to get things that you never had, sometimes you got to do something that you never done. 
And so, you know, you can create a goal that may be this big that you can do on your own. But when you create a goal this big, it requires you to 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 seek out um, other participants who have like minded interests, like minded passions, um, but maybe working and working from for that goal from a different angle to bring to the table because it's going to take, you know, a, a great effort on our part and on the parts of others in order to make this happen. We do have a an event that's coming up on October 29th and it's called the Black Men's Legacy Summit. This summit is bringing together members from the religious community, the nonprofit community, um, the career, health, corporate, and also banking communities uh, to inform and help black men take their rightful place in building legacies and generational wealth for their families. You know, Al, since we've been doing this work, I want to say about 75% of the people that we've been helping have been black women. And that's fantastic. You know, I mean, that's fantastic. But it's it begs the question, where are the brothers? Where are the brothers? Where Where's my brother at? Where's my cousin at? Where's my uncle at? Where Where are they? And how do we, and if they're not here, then how do we get them here? And so the, the, the Black Men's Legacy Summit, it's an effort to get all of the different components to, 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 to attack this problem from a multifaceted perspective to get more players. It's not just people from the financial industry. I've been working in the financial industry, the banking industry for years. Um, I think I started off as a as an underwriter, a processor, then a mortgage underwriter, then a, a due diligence underwriter, reviewing mortgage-backed securities for Wall Street investors uh, for years. Uh, and I came on to build wealth to take the information and the knowledge that I've had helping others build wealth for their families to to see what we can do to move the dial in our community. Commissioners, uh, uh, all three of you, thank you all for being here. I want you to respond uh, because everybody seems to be singing the same song. Uh, you're talking about it, Commissioner Alice, from uh, the structure of the government enabling uh, good things to happen in different divisions or departments of the, of the government. Uh, Commissioner Brown and Commissioner Ho, you both are doing direct things to uh, create change and opportunity. And it's wonderful to have this conversation with the three of you and with Jeffrey Robertson as well. Uh, I'm gonna close out with going around the horn and asking each of you to make kind of a closing statement, an impression, a thought, or even a marching order for our community. And uh, how do we go forward? Commissioner Alice, uh, thank you so much. And let me go with you first. To unmute, 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 please. <laughs> There we go. Thank you. If you are a business owner or you know a business owner, please do visit the Department of Administration's website and look into how to become a certified business and contact us for further information about how to do business with the state. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ho? I, uh, I think that if you are needing help, because you're behind on your mortgage, I just want to take a moment to say that we have a program called Home Help MN that can help you get caught up if you're behind on your mortgage. And it's a government program with higher income limits than most government programs have. So just go out to homehelpmn.org. Some money left, some federal assistance, and we want to help Black homeowners who have a home who have fallen behind get caught back up so they can keep that home. So I'll just say that, and I'll just say the other cool thing about working at the state is you get to work with great nonprofit partners, and I really enjoy the relationship we have with Build Wealth, so it's great to be on with Jeffrey. Commissioner Brown, uh, uh, a closing thought or statement? Yes, thank you. Just echoing, you know, come work at the state. And and even if you're not working at the state, right, we all, we all have a role to play in this. And look on the DHS website in the upcoming days, we are going to be uh, promoting some engagement opportunities. So, you know, we can talk about the disparities, talk about the different ways that we want to address them, but we also need help from our community members to help us do that. And we have to do it together. And so we'll have some opportunities for in the child welfare space to um, form an African-American Child Wellbeing Advisory Council. And that will be promoted soon on our DHS website. And we look forward to uh, working in partnership with folks on that. Thank you. Super, Jeffrey, final word for you. Uh, invite people again to your event coming up at the end of the month. 
Yes. So for more information regarding the Black Men's Legacy Summit, scheduled for Saturday, October 29th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Regional Acceleration Center, the Thor Building at 1256 Penn Avenue North on the fifth floor, please visit 9000equities.com or call 612-871-9000. That's 612-871-9000. Listen, this has been a wonderful conversation. Kudos to each of you, to all of you. I, I want to take a minute to also uh, thank uh, Governor Walsh and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan. I think they have uh, in you assembled a phenomenal team of uh, believers, of doers, of visionaries, and of people who serve our state and whose intention is to serve our state in ways it has never uh, been able to before. Hopefully, if all of us get out and vote, uh, our vote can enable uh, these visions to uh, come uh, forth more broadly, more aggressively, uh, and more beneficially to all of us here in the state of Minnesota. Uh, we're here every day for the conversation. Please join us. Let people know that you are here, that you're listening. Share, like, uh, subscribe, and uh, be what the, with us. Our goal is to demonstrate how we can be with each other in community. I'm Al McFarland. We'll see you next time. Take care.